I've titled this lecture Revolutions, Tyrants and Wars. It sounds like a terrible title, but that's exactly what it's about. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy. Revelation 17, verse 3. Here is this church controlling this scarlet-colored beast. Revelation 13, verse 4 says, And they worship the dragon, unknowingly of course, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, which has been defined as that power which ruled for 1,260 years, then received a mortal wound, and will rule again at the end of time. And we have identified it, basically, as Catholicism. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Yeah, they're all bowing down to this strange beast, the kings of the world, and the high people of this planet. They pay homage to it. They worship it through their obedience and by giving them the power of the state to deal with any issue. Here is an interesting uh, quote from Popery, Puseism, and Jesuitism. At what then do the Jesuits aim? According to them, they only seek the greater glory of God, but if you examine the facts, you will find that they aim at universal dominion alone. You see, Rome had lost universal dominion, and the Protestant Reformation had been a major problem in this issue. A major problem. They have rendered themselves indispensable to the Pope, who without them could not exist, because Catholicism is identified with them. They have rendered them indispens themselves indispensable to governors and hold revolutions in their hands. And in this way, either under one name or another, it is they who rule the world. You see, the papacy has crowned itself ruler of the entire world. The Pope is the ruler of the entire world. That's the Holy Roman Empire spread over the entire planet. Well, if we have a look at a century of revolutions starting from 1750 to 1850, we'll see the American Revolution in 1776, and we can ask the presidents that then ruled who do they think was resp were responsible for this revolution. Then there's the French Revolution, 1789. The Spanish Revolution, 1823. The Polish Revolution, 1831. The German and the Italian Revolution, 1848. By 1917, you had the Russian Revolution, and then basically it was time for war, 1914 to 1918, which made the Russian Revolution, by the way, possible, and World War II, 1939 to 1945. That's a lot of conflict on this planet. How much blood did not flow on this planet as a consequence of these revolutions. And why? Because one power wanted absolute control. And the Bible says the dragon gave it its power so that everybody should be subject to that power and to none other. Well, let's have a look at a brief chronology here. In 1717, we're dealing with this time period of terrible, terrible conflagration on this planet. The Masonic Grand Lodge of England was founded. England was a thorn in the flesh, it was a Protestant nation, so a Masonic Grand Lodge is founded to infiltrate this power. 1721, the first Masonic Lodge was founded in France. 1731, Benjamin Franklin was initiated as a Freemason. 1738, the Roman Catholic Church condemns Freemasonry. Now that's a brilliant move. That's called dialectic thinking. You create an organization, you ban it, your insiders belong to the organization, but the outsiders see that you have distantiated yourself, it can't be your fault. You see how clever that is? Whereas at the Vatican, all the lodges remained and all the cardinals were members, but not the Goyim. It was to be 
a Protestant army under the control of the Jesuit order, and we did an entire lecture on that, and you can get it, uh, the one on who's behind the secret societies. By 1758, Sir Francis Dashwood found the Hellfire Club. Benjamin Franklin visits England to discuss the future of American colonies with Dashwood. 1768, foundation of the right of strict observance, that's the 33 degree level of Freemasonry, by Baron von Hunt, based on the Templar tradition. So that's an interesting point. And then Frederick of Prussia, Frederick the Great, I don't know what was so great about him, but nevertheless, founded the order of the architects of Africa and uses the title Illuminati to describe his neo-Masonic lodges. So that's just a brief history as we're going along. 1770, Benjamin Franklin was elected Grand Master of the Nine Sister Lodge in Paris. 1771, Grand Orient Masonry was founded in France. 1776, Order of the Perfectibilists or Illuminati was founded. Notice they call themselves perfect. The American Revolution starts. So by 1776, they had put everything in place. 1778, Peter I founded the Secret Circle. 1785, Grand Masonic Congress allegedly plotted the French Revolution. The Illuminati was banned in Bavaria, who went underground there. 1789, French Revolution. 1784, Illumist conspiracy to overthrow the Habsburg monarchs of the Holy Roman Empire. So the Monarchies must go. The monarchies were often opposed to uh, Jesuit rule, and they banned the Jesuits. Well, it was payback time. Nobody bans the power of the Roman Catholic Church. In 1816, John Adams wrote to President Jefferson, Shall we not have a regular swarms of them here in as many disguises as only a king of the gypsies can assume, dressed as painters, publishers, writers, and schoolmasters, if ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is this society of Loyola's. They didn't mince words in those days, eh? Wow. That's the new Jesuits. There's the, the quote. Everything I say has got a quote. Now, many writers warned of this great conspiracy of the Jesuits. Samuel Morse, remember, the founder or the inventor of the Morse Code, wrote, The author undertakes to show that a conspiracy against the liberties of this republic, the United States, is now in full action. Under the direction of the wily Prince Metternich of Austria, who, knowing the impossibility of obliterating this troublesome example of a great free nation by force of arms, is attempting to accomplish his object through an agency or an army of Jesuits. The array of facts and arguments going to prove the existence of such a conspiracy will astonish any man who opens the book with the same incredulity as we did. So, those are the people that the presidents believed were behind all these conspiracies. President Abraham Lincoln himself said, the Protestants of both the North and the South would surely unite to exterminate the priests and the Jesuits if they could learn how the priests, the nuns, the monks, which daily land on our shores under the pretext of preaching their religion, are nothing else but emissaries of the Pope of Napoleon III, who was a high Freemason, of course, and other despots of Europe, to undermine our institutions, alienate the hearts of our people from our constitution and our laws, destroy our schools and prepare a reign of anarchy, here as they have done in Ireland, in Mexico, and in Spain, and wherever there are any people who want to be free. That's quite a statement. Fifty years in the Church of Rome, the priest Father Chenicki wrote, he used to be a Catholic and then became a Protestant, this war would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. We owe it to popery that we now see our land reddened with the blood of our noblest sons. Abraham Lincoln, 1865, 16th President of the United States, Lincoln's private letters, they were burnt by his son Robert, restated by Charles Chinicky, who was the personal confidant of the President. In a letter dated 22 January 1870, Massini wrote to Pike, now Albert Pike is this high mason who wrote this, the manual, if you like, of Scottish Freemasonry, he said the following, 
We must allow all of the federations to continue just as they are. It must appear as things are as they were in the beginning. With their systems, their central authorities, and diverse modes of correspondence between high grades of the same right, organized as they are at present, but we must create a super right, which will remain unknown, to which we will call those masons of high degree whom we shall select. With regard to our brothers in masonry, these men must be pledged to the strictest secrecy. Through this supreme right, we will govern all Freemasonry, which will become the one international center, the more powerful because its direction will be unknown. Now, Albert Pike wrote a letter to Mancini, and that was dated August 15, 1871, in which he propagated that there should be a world order, a one order where all nations are under the control of one central organization. And in order to achieve this, they planned, and there are numerous quotes for this, so I've put a number on the screen, because some will say, I don't trust this, I don't trust that, I don't trust the other. Here are references down there, there are references up there, there will be references in other slides, so it comes from different sources. He said, and this was, by the way, on display in the British Museum, and could be seen there until it was taken away. The First World War, to overthrow the power of the Tsars in Russia, protector of orthodoxy, and bring about an atheistic communistic state. Did that happen? Yes. Now that was written long before this event. Long before this event. This was written in 1871. This war broke out in 1914. The Second World War, that's also written long before the event. To originate between Great Britain and Germany, to strengthen communism as, as antithesis to the Judea Christian culture, and bring about a Zionist state in Israel. Did it achieve this objective? Yes. In fact, after this war, Israel, in its present form, was reinstated under the protection of Britain. And then, interestingly enough, a Third World War, a Middle Eastern war involving, involving Judaism and Islam and spreading internationally. That's fascinating. Is that uh, on the cards, or what do you think? It certainly sounds like we are on track. Well, here's another quote, uh, just in case people don't like that quote. Massini with Pike developed a plan for three world wars so that eventually every nation would be willing to surrender its national sovereignty to a war, to a world government. The first war was to end the Tsarist regime in Russia, the second to allow the Soviet Union to control Europe, the third world war was to be in the Middle East between Muslim and Jews and would result in Armageddon. Interesting. Now, how were they going to do it? Let's read what Albert Pike wrote about these wars and uh, how they were going to be um, unleashed. He wrote, quote, we shall unleash the nihilist and the atheist. So the destroyer and the atheist. And we will provoke a formidable social cataclysm which in its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism. Origin of savagery and the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the minority of revolutionaries will exterminate these destroyers of civilization and the multitude, disillusioned with Christianity, will receive the pure light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer. The destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Wow, what a clever plan. So you rub the two systems which you create up against the other. You create atheism as an antithesis to the Judeo-Christian culture. You have these two clash until they rub each other up, and then out of that you will get a new world order where you have a new religion which is far more esoteric and actually honors Satan. Isn't that a rather clever plan? Well, it's very successful. That is why Ordo Ab Kao, Ordo Ab Kao is the, the verse, if you like, that uh, Freemason reuses. This is one of their documents, remember, that I photographed in a Masonic lodge. 
And Weishaupt is the father of Jacobinism. You will remember that we spoke about that in Revelation chapter 11. And Jacobinism was the power that propagated the French Revolution. And we did this in Re Revelation chapter 11, where the Bastille was stormed, liberty leading, the goddess of reason was enthroned instead of Christianity. So Christianity was removed and another reign began. Uh, the monarchy was deposed and Louis and his wife lost their heads, the beheading of Marie Antoinette, and that put an end to that monarchy. Then Robespierre, he headed the Jacobin clubs, and a reign of terror commenced, which in its bloodshed and its violence rivals anything that we have seen to date. The great philosopher, if you like, of the French Revolution was Voltaire. Now you can look it up in any Encyclopedia Britannica. They will tell you who Voltaire was. He was a Jesuit. They will say, of course, he was a renegade Jesuit that left the Roman Catholic Church to write against it. No, no, no. He was just playing the role perfectly. Because they were setting up an antithesis. Do you remember the promise that a Jesuit makes? That I will take either side and do it perfectly as long as in the end the mother church wins? Well, to hold the pen is to be at war. The social contract man is born free and everywhere is in chains. One man thinks himself the master of others but remains more of a slave than they are. That's true. But what if you created the slavery in order to create the misery in order to create the revolution. Isn't that possible? So the philosophers come together and they write a new constitution for this planet called Human Rights. The Declaration of Human Rights, 1798. Declaration Human Rights. You have the all-seeing eye of Lucifer. You have the serpent with a tail in the mouth, the life-giving serpent, the eternal serpent. And you have this funny little Jacobin hat over there on the end of the spear, if you look at the whole thing over there, and then you have this bundle of rods tied together, which are called what? Do you remember what they were called? Fasciae. Fasciae. Bundle of rods tied together. And on top of the fasciae, you have this funny little hat, which was the Jacobean hat, and that's what it looked like. There's a better representation of, also known as the Phrygian cap, once worn in ancient Rome by emancipated slaves as a mark of their freedom and adopted in the revolution as the red cap of liberty. Well, that's what they tell you. That's for the Goyim. Let me tell you what it really is. There it is. This is the god Mitra. And there he is slaughtering the bull. And he's using a dog, a snake, and a scorpion, which has got part, hold of the more delicate parts of this bull, and he's destroying him with unclean animals. This is a war against Christ. Now let's have a look on the side. What does his hat look like? It's the Phrygian hat. So this is Mitraism. And Catholicism is Mitraism. Mitraism was the religion of Persia, it was the religion of Rome, and it is the religion of the Roman Catholic Church. There are seven grades in Mitraism. The highest grade is called Father. And then you've got a congregation. Now, who in the Catholic Church has a congregation and is called Father? The priest, right? And he could be a member of various groups, and so can Catholic priests. They can be whatever. They can be Jesuits, they can be um, Franciscans, they can be Dominicans, they can be members of various other orders as well. So Cyrus the Great was the first one to bring out the Human Rights Charter, now, the mortal wound, as we had discussed it in Revelation chapter 11, just to refresh your memory, 21 February 1798, Pope Pius is dethroned by Napoleon. His ring was torn from his finger and he died in exile. Now, think about this. If Napoleon was a Freemason, then he was under control of whom? Of the Jesuit order. So, who sent Napoleon to Rome to take the Pope captive, the Jesuit order. Why? 
Well, I've thought about this a lot. Within the Roman Catholic Church, there are numerous orders and there has not always existed perfect harmony. In fact, the Jesuit order slowly, slowly took control of all the orders. The Knights of Malta, for example, they did not lightly give up their power seat, but are now subject to the Jes Jesuits. The Dominicans were at loggerheads with the Jesuits. For example, the papacy took the Inquisition away from the Jesuits and gave it to the Dominicans, which created tremendous tension. And in the French Revolution, it was the Dominican order that was destroyed there, not the Jesuits. They controlled the issue. So there were some issues within the church itself that also had to be sorted out to get complete control of the situation. It was even so that at the Council of Trent, many a Roman Catholic stood up and said, the word and the word alone. Don't think that everything in the Catholic Church has always been negative towards the word. No. And Martin Luther must have made an impact as well. And so there were many that weren't in line. So the church itself needed a purging. And then there was another problem. And this problem was this, that the Reformation had fingered Rome as the Antichrist. Now if the Reformation fingers Rome as the Antichrist, any move that seems to emanate from Rome will be looked at with what? Suspicion. So why not destroy the papacy, apparently, and then resurrect it with, and at the same time purge it of everything that is contra, and then resurrect it as a final power in complete control of these organizations. Does that make any sense? That would be a neat trick. And then anything that happened thereafter with a weak little papacy over there would be disregarded. It cannot be from them. It must come from elsewhere. That is how secret societies work. They walk behind fronts, behind fronts, behind fronts. So let's see what happened. By 1804, uh, Pius watches Napoleon crown himself emperor. Napoleon then takes the Vatican States. So Rome is diminishing. By 1848, Massini attacks Rome and uh, Pope is exiled. Papal States are gone. So this power is gone. The Protestants literally relaxed, basically. Dangerous thing to do. Berthier takes the Pope captive. Weishaupt and his fellow Jesuits cut off the income to the Vatican by launching and leading the French Revolution, by directing Napoleon's conquest of the Catholic Europe, and by eventually having Napoleon throw Pope Pius VII in jail at Avignon. Until he agreed, note, as the price of his release to re-establish the Jesuit order. It had been banned, even in the Catholic Church, imagine that. So it had worked underground. This Jesuit war, or maybe it had been banned purposefully to make it seem as if there was a war. You never know, because these people are superb liars. But this is history, this is what happened. This Jesuit war on the Vatican was terminated by the Congress of Vienna and by the secret 1822 Treaty of Verona. There's the quote. Everything I say has got a quote. I'm not making anything up. After Pope Pius was released from Napoleon's prison, he formally restored the Jesuit order with a papal bull. Now that is the strongest worded statement that a pope can bring forth. In 1814, and the pope added in this bull, if any should again attempt to abolish it, the Society of Jesus, he would incur the indignation of Almighty God and of the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul. So this could have been a ruse, it could have been a game, what could have been real, whatever the situation is, we will never really know until the curtain is removed one day, but religious freedom for all. And uh, revolutionaries take to the streets and do what they feel they have to do, Joseph Bonaparte, here he is, 1768, 1844, King of Spain, and he was Grand Master, Grand Orient in France. 
So here you have all the Masonic connections. This comes from the Masonic book, Masonic sources. Napoleon, himself a high Freemason, is now waging war in the whole of Europe, cleaning up the monarchies, and then he has a war with England. Now who controls England by this stage? The Freemasons. So we have a battle of Waterloo. And these are the generals that fought on the two sides. Michel Ney and E. von Crouchy, they are on the side of Napoleon. High Freemason, High Freemason, Napoleon, High Freemason. On the other side, you have General Blücher. Those who are German will know a statement that goes, Ran wie Blücher an der Katzbach. Which means, you know, General Blücher at the river Katzbach, he gave Napoleon blazers. High Freemason. And G. von Schnarrenhorst, High Freemason. They were all Freemasons. So this war, was it really a war? Or was it a planned war? Now, who are the orchestrators of the First World War? Well, there he is. Kaiser Wilhelm I, what has he got on? This comes from a Masonic book. He's got his Masonic apron on. He's a high Freemason. That's what he was. Here is Kaiser Friedrich der Große. There he is with his Freemason regalia from a Freemason book. They're proud that these kings were all Freemasons. So the whole war situation is being planned by Freemasons who are being run by who? By the Jesuits. Now let's have a look at America quickly. Here is this grand building, the Capitol. There is the foundation stone and it says, Laid Masonically, September 17, 1932. Okay, so by that time, America was ruled by Freemasonry. Of course, the people are totally unaware, the institutions continue as before, but they are all being infiltrated. If you look at the, the uh, architecture, the eagles, the symbolism, what you have is sun worship. You have Mitraism displayed here. The street plan of Washington is Masonic. You have the upside down goat of Mendes in the street plan. Then you have the compass and the set square and everything is in blocks of 13, and the Masonic temples are on the 13th Street, etc. The whole street plan of Washington is Masonically laid. So it's dedicated to Lucifer. Of course, the people are unaware of this. The White House is then built with this tremendous stella over there, the height of which is 555 feet. Not 666, that belongs to someone higher, in Rome. This is 555. And uh, isn't that interesting that 555 is the number that Hollywood uses? Have you ever heard when they say, what's the telephone number on any TV program or any one of those? Oh, it's 555, blah, 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 blah. Have you heard of that? It's dedicated to Hollywood. By the way, in Hollywood, Hollywood is the wood they use to make a witch's staff. So it's dedicated to Lucifer. It's witchcraft. But that's just besides the point. So here is the Stella. Let's, who laid these foundations? The Freemasons. So let's ask them what it means. Here is the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. You're going to get a better source than that. Obelisks were originally erected in honor of the sun god. The connection comes from the Egyptian worship of the phallus. So there stands a male whatever in uh, the White House. So we don't have to go. It's dedicated to Osiris and to Isis. And uh, anyway... And that is the structure over there. The military structure is a pentagon, which is the high center of the pentagram into which, for example, 13 witches would step in order, 12 around one, in order to propagate a curse. So this is also a witchcraft structure. So it's just a building, but it has certain connotations. Then France, the one that has this new philosophy for a new world, sends a gift to the United States, the Statue of Liberty. So let's ask UNESCO what it means. UNESCO says, the seven rays emanating from Mitra's halo, there's the god Mitra, uh, symbolize the triumph of the forces uh, over the forces of darkness. Now, <laughs> you must understand that Lucifer says that Michael and his angels represent the forces of darkness. That Yahweh is 
the devil. Isn't that terrible? Do you remember that? We did that? And here UNESCO tells us that the head of the Statue of Liberty is adorned with Mitra's seven rays. The flame she holds is a sun symbol. So this is the torch of Lucifer. Because it doesn't matter whether Lucifer is male or female, he's androgenic in uh, his story. Here is the foundation stone. At this site on August 5, 1884, the cornerstone of the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty, enlightening the world, that's illumination, was laid with ceremony by William so-and-so, Grand Master of Masons. And there's the Masonic sign. So the Statue of Liberty is Masonic. Everything will appear to be Masonic as we continue. Tex Mars writes, Towering above the shimmering but polluted waters, she holds in her outstretched arm and her hand the torch of fire and light, a gift of the Masonic order. The modern inheritors of the Illuminati heritage of the Statue of Liberty was sculptured by Frederick Bartholdi, a member of the Masonic Lodge of Alsace Lorraine in Paris, France. The statue is significant to the secret societies plotting the New World Order. There you go. Right, by 1854, Pius declared the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. Now Mary is being, she's always been there in Roman Catholicism, but now Mary is being placed into the very center and legitimized as the Mother of God and as an entity in heaven. In 1869, Pius summons the first Vatican Council, and in 1870, the dogma of papal infallibility is published. Now we have another God on earth. And ultramontanism triumphs. The Jesuits see to it that all power is concentrated in one man. What happens then? By 1917, the Russian Revolution. And you had this interesting Fatima message. There's a link with Islam there, but never mind, we'll come to that in the next lecture. Russia will be converted, the Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me. And then there was a vision of hell, and the third vision was that the present Pope would have an assassination attack, which happened. Now it's not too difficult, if you've planned all these things from the beginning, to say what will happen. You see? Not too difficult. Now let's have a look at the parallels between the Jesuit French and the Russian revolutions. They work like this. Both revolutions were based on communist writings of Freemasons, Voltaire, Marx. The Jesuits perfected communism on their reductions in Paraguay. So in Paraguay they tested whether this would work or not and perfected it there. Both revolutions plundered the state churches. Both revolutions ended the monarchies. Both the Bourbon and the Romanov dynasties had expelled the Jesuits. Both of them were gone. They weren't going to take this chance again. Both revolutions pre re produced republics in form, but absolute monarchies in power, controlled behind the scenes by the people that were now in control. Both revolu revolutions declared atheism as the religion of the state. Both revolutions carried out a reign of terror by an inquisitional secret police. And boy, was that some reign of terror. Millions, millions died. Stalin is personally responsible for the death of millions of people. Both revolutions resulted in military dictators responsible for the elimination of dissenters. Exactly the same pattern. If it works once, why not use it again? The lesson learned on these Platonic republics there in Paraguay provided the groundwork for Marx's communist manifesto by which every nation on earth would be reduced to granny reductions, thereby destroying the white Protestant middle classes while restoring the communal feudalism of the papal Caesar's dark ages. That's just a quote. Well, it's a bit sharp, but it more or less sums it up. So Karl Marx, by 1844, wrote the, the Communist Manifesto. That's when he wrote it. That's when it was published, 1848. By 1928, Papal Nuncio in Germany leads the Catholic powerful Center Party to the right and helps skyrocket Adolf Hitler to power. Now who's Adolf Hitler? 
By 1929, Pius disbands the Catholic Party. It's done its job, and people are ready to vote. And in the same year, he crowns himself sovereign ruler of the world. What arrogance. Now the Pope is sovereign ruler of the world. In the same year, he signs the documents. Now a ruler has to have a country, and he gets his papal state back, the smallest state in the world. And the papacy now again qualifies as a political entity. Now, it had been dead, it was no longer a political entity, so the beast was mortally wounded, and now it gets its power back, and now it qualifies as a beast again. Its wound was healed, isn't that correct? That's why the San Francisco Chronicle, almost quoting the Bible, says that while they signed this document, the wound was healed in this display. Now we're ready for war. 1934. In Yugoslavia, an organization called the Ustashi is formed. What a disgusting organization. Founded and they assassinate King Alexander of Yugoslavia. Now the Ustashi is a military organization with basically Nazi features and they slaughtered the Serbs. They slaughtered the Orthodox people and forced them to become Catholic or to die one of the two. And nothing is ever said about this tremendous slaughter that took place over here. 1941, Croatia declares itself independent and the slaughter begins. This is the man who is now Pope, Cardinal Secretary of State Eugenio Pazzelli. There is his family, all of the Masonic connection, and of course they have the Banco di Romano at their disposal with Rothschild money. This man, does he have Masonic features? Yes. Here he is at his election. His cell number was 13, a very important number in uh, Freemasonry. There he is in the Masonic triangle stamp that they produced. There he is with the Masonic sign, just as Anthony Sayer had it. And something else. From then on, the papacy, papacy wore the ephod the little plaque that was also worn by the priests of Israel. Now, let's ask Albert Mackey, a 33-degree Freemason, to quote to us what this means. He says, The Grand High Priest of the Royal Arch Freemasonry from 1859-1865 in the USA states in his standard work, this is him, states that the high priest of the royal arch officially wears the ephod. So who's the high priest of Freemasonry? And there is, the Pope. Well, Pazzelli visited uh, the United States and conversed with this man, President F.D. Roosevelt. Now this is a large picture with which should never probably have been released and they're probably very upset that it has been released but it shows Roosevelt in his full Masonic regalia. And there it shows him with his fares on his head and he's receiving a Masonic handshake. Note the Masonic handshake. And uh, interesting fares, we will come to that in the next lecture, what that all symbolizes, why they are wearing fares. And uh, he appoints Myron Taylor as special envoy to the Vatican. Now, let's have a look at the Freemason political leaders in the United States, and I'm just quoting from various sources and web pages. There will be different ones here, so you can check it out for yourself to show you just who's control at the moment. We'll just run through them quickly and see what degrees they are. Bill Clinton, 33 degree. Newt Gingrich, 33 degree. Bob Dole, 33 degree. Jack Kemp, 33 degree. Storm Thurman, 33 degree. Colin Powell, 33 degree. Jesse Helms, 33 degree. Barry Goldwater, 33 degree. Al Gore, probably 33 degree. Then uh, another one over here, another one, James Monroe, Andrew Johnson, James Garfield, McKinley, Roosevelt, of course, William Taft, Franklin Roosevelt, Harding, Lyndon Johnson, Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, oh, all of them. Yitzhak Rabin, Yasser Arafat, Prince Philip, Duke of Kent, many others. Here's another source. Saddam Hussein, that's interesting. We'll have to come to him. 33 degree Freemason. Tony Blair, 33 degree. Gerard Schroeder, 
Prime Minister of Germany, if you like, President, 33 degree. Benjamin Netanyahu, 33. Yasser Arafat, 33 degree. Ronald Reagan, Gorbachev, Helmut Kohl, Shimon Peres. Helmut Kohl is also a committee of 300. Francois Mitterrand, 33, was Grand Orient Lodge, of course. Yitzhak Sarbin, Willy Brandt, all of these old ones were Freemasons. Some more. Joseph Stalin. He was Illuminati. He was a member of the Grand Orient Lodge. Leon Trotsky, Grand Orient Lodge. Kissinger is a member of a committee of 300. J. Edgar Hoover, 33. Cecil John Rhodes, Alistair Crowley. Walt Disney was a 33-degree Freemason. Olive Palm, Al Gore, Tony Blair, Joseph Mengele. That's interesting. That's the mass murderer of the Nazis. He was Illuminati. Robert McNamara. You name it. They're all there. Billy Graham. Oops, sorry. Let's move on. Colonel John Glenn, Buzz Aldrin, everyone who's ever been up in space has to be a Freemason of the highest degrees. Edgar Mitchell, uh, all the way through, Francis Bacon, Lord David Owen, all the negotiators, Richard Halbrook. I'm just running through some of them. Alan Greensprang, Peter Wallenberger, Queen Elizabeth is the queen of the Bilderbergers. Prince Philip, Queen Beatrix, she's the Committee of 300. Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, Committee of 300. And so we go on and on and on and on. Ted Kennedy, Rockefeller, David Rockefeller, Teng Hui, Baron von Rothschild, Hillary Clinton is six grand dame. She's a very high Freemason. Albert Pike, of course, you know, Bertrand Russell, Otto von Habsburg, Weishaupt, all the way back. Here is Edgar Hoover, President Dwight D. Eisenhower. They honors him with the 33... Grand Cross at the special White House ceremony. They're not ashamed of any of this. Here are just about all the presidents of the United States in the presidential gallery of the lodge. I photographed this myself. I went into the lodge. I went into the presidential gallery. I photographed each one of these. And then... <laughs> me? Not me. <laughs> anyway, there they all are. As... Freemasons. If we look at the American dollar, some very interesting things happened under the time of Roosevelt. There is this symbol on the dollar, there's that symbol. We haven't got time for all of this. In God we trust, one. Uh, if you look at this symbol over here, it says, I knew it kept us, novus ortus seclorum. If you intercalate the hexagram, then you'll have this A-S-N-O-M, which is a scrambling of mason, mason. If you go to the other side, it points to objects and it then reads Arlto, you have Arlington. Ah, oh, there's too much there to talk about and uh, many interesting things. If you go to the one and you go to the half moon, there's a little structure over there. Can you see it? It's a micro dot. You'll have to get a magnifying glass and look at it under a magnifying glass and you'll see it's a little owl. A little owl. Owl in a half moon. And this over here you'll see is a spider's web. There's a lot of symbolism over here. Now if you go to the ancient coins, you'll see that the deities were associated with the owl. And you will see that when we went to the Bohemian Grove, what did they worship there? The great owl of Bohemia. And you saw the presidents of the United States bow down to the owl of Bohemia. Quite a scary business. Now looking at this symbol... You have the all-seeing eye of Lucifer. It is not yet on the base of the triangle. When it is placed on, he will have his kingdom. But that is Lewis, Lucifer, Anuit Coptus, he God, Novus Ordo Seclorum, New Order of the Ages. There are 13 levels over there. The bottom one is the date of the founding of the, the independence of the United States, but it is also the founding of the Illuminati. You have the spider's web, symbol of the new age. You have uh, over here the band, the ribbon of Lucifer. You will see it over here in this Roman Catholic Church where you have Anubis, the phoenix, symbol of Jupiter, the god Jupiter, and the skull and crossbones, and there you have the ribbon. You see it? Associated with Jupiter. That's on the flame. And all of these symbols tell us one interesting story. On the other side, you have this symbol. There are nine feathers. There are 13 spears. There are 13 leaves. There are 13 pentagrams. 
shaped in the form of a hexagram. You have the eagle. You have this statement over here, a pluribus unum, out of many one. We're going to reunite all nations. So that's the symbolism of a new world order on the dollar. The world is going to be united under one central government. And that government is going to be in control of Lucifer, not Jesus Christ. Although Jesus Christ, of course, knows about it, permits it, and is ultimately in control. He tells us ahead of time that this is going to happen. And then the end of the story is that Jesus will reign on this planet. In the previous section we were looking at the symbolism on the US dollar and we saw how all of this symbolism is Masonic and appeared on the dollar load after the time of Roosevelt. Revelation 13, 11, And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and it had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. We're going to deal with this prophecy in detail in another lecture. It exercises all the authority of the first beast, which we will find will be Roman Catholicism before it, and causes the earth and those that dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So here was now a Protestant ally that would enforce papal doctrines. But that's in another lecture, complete lecture, called Two Beasts Become Friends. If we look at the architecture even, it is interesting. That is St. Peter's. That is the Capitol building. The architecture is identical. Of course, the building itself was designed, the American one, by Freemasonry. And Freemasonry is in control by whom? The Jesuit order. Now let's have a look at some of the symbolism over there and some of the interesting issues. We are now ready for the Second World War and the three main role players of the Allies Oh, this man over here, Winston Churchill, and he was a what? 33 degree Freemason. We saw Roosevelt in his full Masonic regalia. He was a 32 or 33 degree Freemason. And then we have Stalin, who was, of course, Grand Orient member, so 33 degree Freemason. They're all on one side. Extract from a report by Ambassador Harriman in Moscow to the State Department, June 30, 1944. Stalin paid tribute to the assistance rendered by the United States to Soviet industry before and during the war. He said that about two-thirds of all the large industrial enterprises in the Soviet Union had been built with United States help or technical assistance. The other third had been Britain. So who built the United States? Uh, the USSR. Who built it? The West. The West financed it and built it. Here you can see Winston Churchill in his Drood Masonic Lodge with all his Drood fellows around him. So these are genuine uh, facts. This isn't just conjecture. Do you remember Pearl Harbor? Well, fortunately, the 50 Years of Secrecy Act are, for, are passed. And so now we know for a fact, because this has been revealed, that they knew that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked. Is that correct? And they chose not to do anything about it. Why? Because they needed an incident to start a war. The American Constitution was not going to permit them to enter a war. They needed an incident and they created it. In fact, that is mass murder of their own people. Is that correct? Because they knew about it. This is public knowledge. It's in the news. The 50 years secrecy is up. Nobody can deny it anymore. It's a fact. So America, once before, has killed thousands of its own people to allow something to become possible that wasn't possible before. Once done successfully, do you think I could do it again? I wonder. What about the other side? Hitler. Hitler said, I learned much from the order of the Jesuits. Until now, there has never been anything more grandiose on earth than the hierarchical system of the Catholic Church. 
I transferred much of this organization into my own party. The SS was constituted according to the Jesuit principles. Himmler, head of the SS, was closely associated with the Jesuits through his father and brother. Hitler said of him, I can see Himmler as our Ignatius of Loyola. And Joseph Goebbels was also a trained Jesuit. So, the two sides, who controls them both? The same parties. This is called thesis, antithesis. Goebbels, Himmler, these people were Jesuits. They were fascists. Adolf Hitler, fascist, using the symbolism of the sun god. The Maltese cross, the symbols of the sun god. Here he is with uh, uh, Hindenburg himself, of course, a Freemason. This thing is all entirely planned. Gaining the youth on his side, one of the principal Catholic personalities to help Hitler to power was Franz von Papen. And Franz von Papen, of course, leader of the Catholic Party, helped to skyrocket uh, Hitler to power. So the Catholic Church skyrocketed Hitler to power. And these are posed pictures. They have Masonic meaning, but we'll get to that later. The Reichsadler, chosen as the symbol, Masonic symbol. And uh, the supposed happy alliance in the beginning, which then deteriorates. Here you see the salute with the Masonic uh, activities associated with it. Here he is together with the church leaders. And here you can see the cardinals giving the Heil Hitler salute. So the church was very much involved with the Nazi movement. There is a bunch of cardinals giving the Heil Hitler salute. The Pope and the Führer, you will recall that even to this day there is tremendous anger about Pope Pius having now been declared on his way to sainthood because of his connection with the Nazi movement. Well, here is the new Reichsbischof Ludwig Müller, the Protestant one who greets Adolf Hitler with a nice handshake. The previous one, the previous po Protestant bishop, no longer lived because Adolf Hitler had him executed. So this one must have been a puppet on the religious side. So the Catholics and the Protestants next to each other. Now understand the war. Let's think about the war. Who is the problem in terms of the Roman Catholic Church? Firstly, the Orthodox Church in the East had been a problem. The First World War sorted that out. The Tsar had been removed and the Orthodox Church had been subjected, as were all the churches, to make it look right, by atheistic communism. But the leaders of communism were all Catholics. In fact, I have traveled in many of those countries and the people, the old people all told me, now we understand why the leaders of the communist regimes, why they all attended the Catholic Church. Why, if they were all atheists, were they such good Catholics? Well, this mighty army is built up, but Germany is divided. The north of Germany, and particularly the east of Germany, is all Protestant. They're Lutherans. And they are skeptical of the papacy. Whereas the south of Germany is all Catholic. In the Orthodox countries, like the entire USSR, you have the Orthodox Church controlling the mindset of the people. Now, since the takeover of communism, that has been reduced or subjected, and the Orthodox Church has been subject to the state. Now comes this mighty wall. The symbols being carried here are the symbols of Lucifer. They're also used in theosophy. There you can see them. There's the swastika, the all-seeing serpent. And Adolf Hitler himself was a tremendous occultist. Of course, as a Jesuit insider, he would be. But of course, his outer garb of religion was Catholicism. You'll find the same swastika on the foot of Buddha. And, as I recall, as I told you before, it was a Jesuit priest, Father Stempfler, 
not Hitler who really wrote Mein Kampf. So a Jesuit wrote the book. The SS has the same symbols as the Skull and Bones people, the skull with the crossbone, meine Ehre heißt Treue, uh, my honor means um, Treue, to be loyal, loyalty. The SS had been organized by Himmler according to the principle of the Jesuit order and became basically the new, if you like, inquisition. And anybody who did not obey the system was destroyed. Now we read much in the literature about six million Jews who were destroyed. But we read nothing about two and a half million of the most brilliant people in Germany, all the professors, all the intelligent, highly educated Germans who were killed by Adolf Hitler. You see, thinking people cannot be tolerated in such a regime downgrade the mindset. We must have serfs and elite. Goyen, catechumens, cattle, and then the super illuminists. How irritating. Remember that the Jesuit magazine, Civilta Catholica, house organ of the Jesuits, says quite frankly, fascism is the regime, the regime that corresponds most closely to the concept of the Church of Rome. Fascism is fascinating, excuse the pun. Fascism has one central leader. You see, Pope eventually, one central leader, one central leader, total control over the people, yet the people believe that they are free because they are getting everything that they require. Unlike communism, they may have property rights, but the property rights are qualified, and I'll come to that in a later lecture in case you are duped into that. Now here are these fasciae, let's have a look at them, the bundle of rod accompanied by an axe or a spear which symbolized power over life and death carried by the Roman official as symbol of authority. Under the Republican conflict or Praetor, the starting on an expedition, he took his vows on the Capitoline Hill where the Vatican sits today. This is very symbolic. He acclaimed, if acclaimed, imperator, in other words, leader by his troops, he decked his fussy with a laurel and on his return deposited the wreath upon the Capitoline Hill. Everything leads to Rome. Fascinating story. So when you find the fasci, you must know that Rome is behind it. Fascist regimes use the fasci. So fasci can look like that with an axe or the axe can go through or it can be a spear like it was in the French Revolution. These are fasci. Now where do we find the fasci? Well, in 1888, campaign poster of incumbent President Grover Cleveland, uh, Benjamin Harrison defeated them, but later he won. Cleveland was re-elected to a non-consecutive term. There his ego is standing on two fasci. See it? Fascism, hidden in the United States. Do you know the, the United States should be as far as the east is from the west from fascism, isn't it? Well, 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 isn't that fascinating? The U.S. Capitol building, if you go right to the tippy-toppy, that's what you have. Fasci, 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 fasci. So the United States eventually is going to become a fascist state. Nobody would have believed that 50 years, 100 years ago, 10 years ago, maybe not even 5 years ago. Today? What does it look like? Is there mighty state control over every single one, just like in the times of the SS? If you move, is there a new uh, law coming out which will watch the people of the state? Yes or no? Yes, Patriot Bill, have you heard of that? All kinds of interesting laws coming out. Now, what type of government is that? Interesting. There it is. Did you know that the fasci here, fasci behind the rostrum podium of the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., note the back of the chair resembles a golden axe. There it is, the axe and the fasci. So they knew this all along. They're just waiting for the opportunity, biding their time. Ancient Roman coins with the fasci. Here is a fasci on the back of a dime in America with a the flame there, fasci on a US dollar, 
and presidents sitting next to fasciae is Washington. Even Abraham Lincoln sat on a fasciae chair. Is the insignia of the uh, National Guard. It has fasciae. There are fasciae in the Statue of Liberty. Let's read what Anthony Sutton, remember this man who wrote about skull and bones, educated at the University of London, Gottingham, California, research fellow, Hoover Institute. This is an important man. Let's see what he has to say. How the order creates war and revolution. Talking now about skull and bones, which is the Illuminati, which is the Jesuits behind the scenes, as we have seen. Operational history of the order can only be understood within the framework of Hegelian dialectic process. Hegel, the great man who said, always create two directions. Thesis, antithesis, rub them up against the other. Who cares how many people die in the process? Then you have synthesis. Then you get what you actually want. From this axiom it follows that controlled conflict can create a predetermined history. For example, when the Trilateral Commission the subject managed conflict, etc. We'd read this quote before, so I'll just skip it. The synthesis, that's which comes together, sought by the establishment is called the New World Order. Without controlled conflict, this New World Order will not come about. Random individual action of persons in society would not lead to the synthesis. It's artificial. Therefore, it has to be created. So you hear about a war here and a war there and a revolution here and a revolution there. Revolutions have to be financed. You never hear where the money comes from to finance them. Who finances the revolutions? Who runs them? You see? So you have Nazis against Soviet unions, North Korea, North Vietnam, ad nauseum against the United States, the conflict built profits while pushing the world ever closer to a one-world government. Now isn't it logical that that's what Satan wants? He wants a one-world government. So in Hegelian philosophy, the conflict of political right and political left, or thesis and antithesis in Hegelian terms, is essential to forward movement of history and historical change itself. Have you noticed that every country has a left party and a right party? Have you heard about that? And your country has a two, otherwise there would be no point to vote, right? Two of them. Now, let's have a look how this is worked. President Woodrow Wilson made this statement. This is now President speaking. Some of the biggest men in the United States in the fields of commerce and manufacturing know that there is a power so organized, so subtle, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. Aha, so here is a power that controls things. Karl Marx in Das Kapital posed capitalism as thesis and communism as antithesis. Now you'll have Jesuits clamoring for capitalism and you'll have Jesuits clamoring for communism. The clash of opposites must in the Hegelian system bring about a society neither capitalist nor communist. That's synthesis. Moreover, in the Hegelian scheme of events, this new synthesis will reflect the concept of the state as God and the individually as totally subordinate to an all-powerful state. If you don't do what the state says, sizzle fits. That's what Adolf Hitler practiced. Two and a half million Germans sizzle fits God. What then is the fun function of Parliament? Now take note, I'm not saying this, I'm reading it. I get criticized for this statement, you cannot believe. Please don't criticize me, write to these people. I'm just quoting. What then is the function of a Parliament, a Congress, for Hegelians? These institutions are merely to allow individuals to feel that their opinions have some value, and to allow a government to take advantage of whatever wisdom the peasant may accidentally demonstrate. <laughs> All right? Now let's see how Hegel puts it himself. This is now the great philosopher Hegel, where the politicians bow down to him. He says, By virtue of this participation, subjective liberty and conceit with their general opinion, individuals, can show themselves palpably, palpably efficacious and enjoy the satisfaction of feeling themselves to count for something. In other words, we're just idiots. 
So if you vote, who are you voting for? I'll tell you who you're voting for. I always say this. They vote for the devil in pink or the devil in blue. The vote makes no difference. It's a joke. Politics is a joke. War, the organized conflict of nations for Hegelianism, is only the visible outcome of the clash between ideas. As John Dewey, the Hegelian darling of modern education system, puts it, he's in control of the whole new world education. War is the most effective preacher of the vanity of all merely finite interests. It put an end to the selfish egoism of the individual by which he would claim his life and his property as his own or as his family's. Did you get that? Now surely Rome doesn't think like that. Oh, I'll show you papal bulls which will make your hair stand on end. New one. Compare this to the spirit and letter of the Constitution of the United States, which says absolutely the opposite. All right? So for these elitists, the state is supreme, and a self-appointed elite running the state acts indeed as God on earth. The rest are catechumens, cattle, and goyim. College textbooks present war and revolution as more or less accidental results of conflict, but they never... Never in Western textbooks will you find the evidence that revolutions need finance, and the source of the finance, in many cases, traces back to Wall Street. Operational vehicles for conflict creation, the key to modern history is in these facts. The elitists have close working relations with both Marxists and Nazis. They play on both sides because what they have created is just a game. In this memor memorandum, we will present the concept that world history certainly since 1970, reflects deliberately created conflict with the objective of bringing about a synthesis, a new world order. So let's have a look how it worked. Here's the order. The thesis is Marxist Russia, Second World War now. The antithesis, Nazi Germany. Who financed them? Who fi financed the, the Russians? Guarantee Trust Company. Who financed the Nazis? Guarantee Trust company. And then you have Harriman, formerly of Harriman and Company, etc., etc. Same people over here. Harriman, Nazi interests. Same people finance both sides. Then you have the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917 and 1933, Hitler's ascension to power, conflict between the two, tremendous profit, and the result, post-World War II, United Nations as the first step to a new world order. There you have it. Beautifully. Financed by the same side. By 1948, the atomic race. By 1950, Mary receives pilgrim status. 1950, Francis Matthew calls for nuclear war with Russia, and they start arguing between the two of them. Notice how many were killed by Stalin. Among the 1,766,188 victims up to the beginning of 1922, Figures obtained from the Soviet documents, nearly 5,000 were priests, teachers, nuns, etc. of the Greek church. As soon as the persecution extended to the millions of Lutheran, Reformed, Baptist, Methodist, and especially Mennonite Christians. The circulation of the Bible is not only strictly forbidden, but punishable by exile. So that's what Stalin did. Stalin killed millions. We hear of 6 million Jews. Well... Think in terms of 30, 40, 50 million people when you think of Stalin, the greatest mass murderer this world has ever seen. And Foster Dulles, President Kennedy, what is the story there? Well, here is Kennedy, and he's married to this young lady, Jacqueline Kennedy, and they are setting up the United States for a tremendous conflict in the end, and every president has to play the game. Eventually, this president dies, and this one takes over, Lyndon Johnson. But did you know something interesting? A president has to swear on the Bible when he takes over. Did you know that Lyndon Johnson refused to swear on the Bible? What did he swear on? Lyndon Johnson is sworn in as president by Judge Sarah T. Hughes. Just hour after the assassination, Judge Hughes brought a small Bible for the swearing-in ceremony, but it was substituted for a Roman Missal mass book that was found on the plan. So he swears on a Roman Missal, he refused to swear on the Bible. Doesn't that tell you something? Isn't that interesting? 
I find that very interesting. Now why did that president have to go? He was a Roman Catholic after all. Is it possible that not all Roman Catholics are so easily duped? Here's the motorcade as it travels along. Here you have Mrs. Kennedy helps the Secret Service agent, Clint Hill, climb into the car at the back when the president was shot. And uh, here are the roses she received. Very interesting. Here is Dallas, 11.22, on November 22, 1963, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, 35th President of the United States, visited Dallas. That's interesting. Also the number 11 over there. That's the building. Here's the building from which he was apparently assassinated from that window, so they say. There it is, a little bit larger. And uh, here's the plaque where they have written what happened over here. On November 22, the building gained the national notor notoriety when Lee Harvey Oswald, and somebody did the trouble to underline allegedly, <laughs> shot and killed President John F. Kennedy. And uh, most people don't believe that Lee Harvey Oswald shot the president. The president's car came down the street. That tree was not yet there and was apparently shot from that window over there. And it happened approximately where I'm standing relative to this picture. Now notice as he comes down here, he's traveling on this side of the road. And imagine hordes of people standing on either side. And here is a little uphill. And when you go further into the hall over here, there was a picket fence. And if you looked from the picket fence, you could look down onto the street. And apparently, when the shots were fired, over a hundred people, including the police, it didn't run this way, but ran up this embankment towards the picket fence. Now, why did they run to the front of the president and not from behind the president? Apparently, they say, Lee Harvey Oswald shot him from behind, and he was the only one who shot, and he shot from behind, and he hit him over here. A very, very fantastic shot, by the way, if it is so. It only has a little problem. The president's head didn't go forward, it went backwards. And he hit, it hit him here in the throat. And there was a small entry wound in the front and a huge one in the back. So from where was he hit? From the front or from the back? He was hit from the front. Not only that, there were shots from other places along the side and there was an intercalation which all hit the president. There is even evidence that the driver himself who happened to be left-handed rotated and shot the president himself with a pistol as well. He had multiple shots. Of the witnesses that ran towards the picket fence, over a hundred of them, almost all of them, except for one or two ladies who were ridiculed, were assassinated themselves. Is that not strange? Wouldn't you think that was strange if all the witnesses died strangely? Well, this is one of the biggest cover-ups that probably ever occurred. Here's the picket fence. And when you're looking there, that's how it was. Someone behind the picket fence would shoot. And this would be the view from the picket fence. I'm now pretending to be there. I took these pictures myself. And the cross would be there. So he would shoot the president at this short distance and hit him from the side front. Now it's interesting that the president's head jerked to his back and to his left. Bah! Like that. That means that he must have been shot from the front side, right? Isn't that logical? All right, now am I saying this or is this public knowledge? This is public knowledge. And yet it is denied by government because they have one culprit, Lee Harvey Oswald. There's the place where he died, stretch out from the picket fence. Now, let's have a look how J.F. Kennedy died. And let's look at the television um, production of this issue. And then you make your own uh, opinion. If we can have the sound on. Let's go back to that thing.
day in Dallas. The day was November 22nd, the time shortly before noon. At first the crowds were thick, but as the motorcade approached Dealey Plaza, it was here that the motorcade violated the Secret Service's own rules. As the car turned, it slowed from 40 miles an hour to 7. It was precisely then that gunshots blasted out. For six seconds, the occupants of Kennedy's car were struck by bullets. Kennedy grasped for his throat. He grabs for his throat. Kennedy's head exploded, driven with great force backwards and to the left. Then and only then did the president's car accelerate and speed off. Lyndon Johnson, the new president, ordered a federal commission to investigate the crime. The Warren Commission had given us the official version. Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone. But if all three shots had come from behind, then why did the president's head fly backwards? Why did so many people, including policemen, run not towards the book depository where Oswald was, but towards the picket fence? If the Warren Commission was right, why did so many witnesses claim to see something completely different from the official report? As many as 177 people died simply for knowing too much. The moment Kennedy was killed, a massive cover-up went into operation. Witnesses were threatened, and many were killed. Bill Health interviewed immediately afterwards. Shots rang out, and he grabbed his chair. There was an interval, and then three or four more shots rang out. By that time, the motorcade fed away. With us now is Gene Hill, who is closer to the president's car than anyone else at the time of the shooting. Ms. Hill is a Dallas grade school teacher and has feared for her life for the last 29 years. I understand that two men claiming to be Secret Service agents interrogated you after the assassination. What were you asked? They asked me what I had seen. I told them uh, that I'd seen the president hit, that I saw a shooter from the knoll, and that I'd heard four to six shots. But they told me I didn't hear but three shots. Were you ever in interviewed by the Warren Commission? Oh, yes. I was interviewed by... Uh, our inspector who, uh, well, he tried very hard to discredit everything I said. He uh, accused me of all kinds of things from like a shabby marital affair to seeking publicity to just downright lying. We found uh, the real facts and certainly no one in the intervening 25 years has disproved our basic conclusions. It was Specter who came up with the so-called magic bullet theory, which tracks one bullet going through both Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly. The bullet was later discovered virtually intact on Connolly's hospital stretcher. The truth, had it been known, had it come out, it was revealed there was a conspiracy. The conspiracy to kill the president needed the scapegoat, a patsy, someone who would take the blame. There were many things you weren't supposed to see. Like the paraffin test given to Oswald, it proved conclusively that Oswald had not fired a rifle that day. Or the spy camera found in Oswald's possessions, issued to him by the U.S. government. Or Oswald's letter to a Mr. Hunt, requesting his next assignment. The only Hunt we know of in this case is Howard Hunt of the CIA, who shared the same office with Oswald in New Orleans. The office belonged to Guy Bannister, formerly with the FBI. Not only was this address on Oswald's supposedly pro-Castro leaflets, but the account Oswald used to print the leaflets belonged to the CIA. Howard Hunt with the CIA, Guy Bannister with the FBI, and Lee Harvey Oswald, all in the same office. Kennedy's motorcade was arranged to make two turns, taking him directly into a triangulation. The first shot came from the picket fence. It hit Kennedy in the throat. The second shot came from the Dow text building next to the book depository. It entered Kennedy's back. The third shot came from the southwest corner of the book depository, seventh floor. It hit Conlon. The fourth shot came from the Dow text. It narrowly missed, it hit the curb, wounding a bystander. The fifth and sixth shots were fired almost simultaneously from the depository and from the picket fence. Both hit Kennedy in the head, one from above, moving him forward. Then, an instant later, one from the front, tossing him back. Here you see the passenger in the front turning back, looking at the president instead of 
jumping back to his system. He turns forward. The driver is now rotating. The weapon comes into view and he fires. You'll see this repeatedly in these sequences. Kennedy's been shot in the throat. He's leaning to his left. The driver now begins to rotate. His left arm comes over his right shoulder and he fires now. Again, you see the driver rotate. You see the weapon come into view. He's rotating again. The weapon is in view. He fires. You can clearly see his head turning and the, his arm and the weapon extending into view over his right shoulder. One of the first activities of William Greer after the presidential limousine arrived at Parkland Hospital was to attain a bucket and a sponge and water and begin to wash the blood and brains off of the presidential limousine. There's a new theory about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. A government scientist says police audio tapes provide new evidence of a second gunman. If it could be proved that the sound on the tape was a gunshot and that, in fact, it came from the grassy knoll, then it would provide some evidence that there was a second gunman in addition to Lee Harvey Oswald. But so far, few who agree with the conclusion made by Thomas. Hello? Yes, Rick. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to know why it's taken uh, so long for this information and the truth uh, to be exposed. First place, it hasn't been exposed yet, and I don't think it ever will be. Secrecy in government is designed for one purpose and one purpose only. Not to keep the enemy or the opposition from knowing what's going on, but to keep the American people from knowing what is going on. And all the evidence that exists or might have existed that would implicate uh, the government in Kennedy's assassination, you can be sure that evidence is now destroyed. And so even if everything is released now, the chances of solving the Kennedy assassination and uh, attaching the blame to the guilty parties is almost impossible. Kennedy was changing the status quo, but decided he could no longer trust the CIA. He was transferring covert operations directly to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Shortly after that, he fired Alan Dulles, who had been the Director of Central Intelligence since 1953. Kennedy continued to make enemies as he pulled back from world confrontation. He ordered U.S. troops out of Vietnam. This was an incident that took place... Well, you saw... That driver rotate, if you could see it, it was very difficult. You could see his head go back. You could see all these things. Vatican Assassin says, but after the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion, President Kennedy changed due to his betrayal by the Jesuit Council of Foreign Relations in the person of McGeorge Bundy. He sought to break the CIA into a thousand pieces. Now the CIA would be like the SS. Why break that? Then he called for a return to America's currency to the gold standard. That was a major problem that would stop the Federal Reserve. And another thing that he said, he said, I will separate church and state. I think that was a big mistake that he made in the eyes of the Jesuits. Remember that Loyola said, finally let all with such artfulness gain the ascendant over princes, noblemen and magistrates of every place, that they may be ready at our beck even to sacrifice their nearest relations and most intimate friends when we say it is for our interest and advantage. That's fascinating. We know, of course, that Jacqueline Kennedy was raised in a Jesuit convent. But let's leave it there. One of Nixon's main speech writers during three whole years was Jesuit father, the Reverend John McLaughlin who wrote Nixon's speeches at a salary of 32000 a year, which was a lot of money at that time. And the next president, one of the next ones, Gerald Ford, there's his own signature, 33 degree Freemason. I took this picture myself in the Masonic Lodge. There he signs it, 33 degree Freemason. These people are not who they say they are. And when we look at him, and we look at these handshakes that they have, and uh, the holy alliance between the papacy and the United States of America, this is by the way a signal picture, and Reagan appointed this man to be a representative to the Vatican. So by 1987, Pope John Paul visits the United States, President Reagan meets him and he says, as you exhort us, we will listen. This is not separation of church and state. 
For with all our hearts we yearn to make this good land better still. The Pope is quoted as saying, I come as a friend, a friend of America and of all Americans, Catholics, Orthodox, Jews, all men of good will. Well, interesting. Here he is together. This, by the way, also a Masonic signal picture, but we won't go into the details. That's also a Masonic signal picture. We won't go into those details. How do they plan their trips? Let's ask them. Here's Ronald Reagan planning his trip to this president of Russia. Then in September, Gorbachev proposed a pre-summit meeting in Reykjavik, Iceland. Washington agreed. The astrologer fixed the time and the date of departure, and at 9.45 on October the 9th, Reagan flew to Reykjavik. For instance, if you have very bad Saturn, you should cultivate Jupiter so that... Uh... Wow! He's now acting like Nebuchadnezzar. Let's call the astrologers to tell us when this meeting should take place. You know? The 11th is a very important date. Presidents die on it. Buildings collapse on it. It's very interesting. My Pope, Pope Paul II, I confirm for you as the Pope of my secret, the Pope about whom I spoke to the children during the apparitions, the Pope of my love and my sorrow. This is what Mary apparently said to the children at Fatima. This is the Pope of the secret, or this is the, the Mary predicted that he would have an assassination, this Pope, and the modern channels through Father Gobi say that this is the Pope of the promise. Well, Malachi Martin, in the Keys of This Blood, this uh, is a pontifical work, writes, clearly the new agenda, heaven's agenda, the grand design of God for a new world order had begun. And Pope John Paul would stride now in the arena of the millennium endgame as something more than a geopolitical giant of his age. He was and remains the serene and confident servant of the grand design. There's another Masonic language. He's going to be the head honcho, the main man. All this bloodshed, all these wars. In Germany, what happened? What did the war do in Germany, the Second World War? In Germany, the north of Germany was devastated. It was firebombed, which was illegal according to all conventions. They threw firebombs on the north of Germany. Hamburg was gutted by firebombs. Now, firebombs don't just destroy military targets. What do they destroy? They burn human beings alive. So it was targeted to destroy the people. And then East Germany, the entire Protestant conclave was cut out and handed over to Soviet Russia for two generations of enforced atheism. Today there's no Protestant left anymore. Protestantism has been destroyed. The Orthodox Church has been subjugated. All of them are subject to Rome. Millions of Serbians died. Millions. It has been a slaughter in the last centuries such as this world has not seen. Why? To gain full control of the world. Here is Gerard Newkirk states, over the last two decades, in particular during the Reagan years and the last two with George W., the United States is looking less like a democracy and more like a highly evolved fascist creature. Isn't that interesting? I'm not saying this, I'm just reading it. Devoid of the idiosyncrasies and shortcomings of its progenitors where they practice this, this form of fascism has a propaganda machine that is arguably the most efficient the world has ever seen. We are in an interesting time frame. And here you see George Bush with a with the Pope, here you see the Prime Minister of England who, with the Pope, all these thousand points of light. 33 degree Freemason skull and bones member, Illuminatist, 33 degree Freemason, with the Pope. And now, let's have a look at this picture. Here is President George W. Bush with the Pope under the picture of Ignatius Loyola. Who is going to be the great spiritual leader of the new world order. Please note this picture. The Pope sits on the altar of Korazim. This is when he visited uh, 
Jerusalem and Israel recently. Israel. The backdrop depicts Christ with an open book that reads, Love your enemies, I will come soon. What else do you see on his throne? An upside-down cross. There's the Pope too with an upside-down cross. Symbol of Lucifer's victory over Jesus. This is a sad state of affairs. And we looked at the teachings of Illuminism. We looked at the teachings of the Masonic Order, of the secret societies, and we saw that Lucifer was their god. They said so themselves. And what do we have to do? Come out of her, my people, that you not be partakers of her sins. I believe that we are on the threshold of history. I believe that the final events are unfolding. And I believe that we need have no fear because God said that he would give them the opportunity to show their true colors. The final apostasy against God will end in the greatest victory the universe has ever seen and the kingdom of God will soon be ushered in. If you thought that this was long in the future, I have news for you. It is at the door. Jesus is coming soon. Thank you.